I read this story about a, a, a warehouse and the dock, loading dock of the warehouse. There was a box that was found, and on the top, these big, this big decal in black and white said, danger, do not touch. As you can imagine, everybody stayed clear of that, all the uh, fork truck drivers and so forth. Nobody wanted to get close to that box. And finally, the, the second shift foreman comes along and with safety glasses, with special gloves, with a box cutter to cut the, the tape, he very, very slowly opens it up, opens the box up. And inside were 12 stickers that said, danger, do not touch. <laughs> and I want to talk to you this morning about not touching. We're beginning our series called Blueprints, 10 Laws of Love and Freedom, and this takes us back to Exodus chapter 20, if you want to join me there. Exodus chapter 20, and the challenge at the very beginning as we look at this is a very simple one, and that is, how does a holy God relate to unholy people? Holy just meaning he's so far removed. Holy certainly in his morality, but holy in terms of his distance. That's what, that's what the word literally means, to be separated from. The distance between God and man is great. <clears throat> in terms of a strength and power, in terms of purity, in terms of everything, he's just so far removed from us. You know, he loves us and cares for us. But how do we relate to holy God being unholy people? The, the people, the children of Israel, if I can give you a little bit of the context, they had been in the land of Egypt for centuries now as slaves. And then God brought them out of slavery, leading them through Moses and then through the plagues, loosening the grip of Pharaoh, and they're able to come out. Now it's three months out of Egypt. They're in the desert. Uh, they've got some wonderful things ahead of them yet, Kadesh Barnea and their lack of faith, and they're going to be wandering in the wilderness. But they don't know any of that yet. They, are, they have to be struggling with their identity. Who are we? We're not the Israelites, because we've never been to that land. We've only heard about it. We were in Egypt, but we weren't Egyptians. We didn't have voting rights. We were slaves. But we're not in Egypt anymore. We're in the desert. Are we a nomadic group of people? Who are we? And God clears up their identity by saying this, I'm your God, and you're my people. That's all we need to know about identity. Some of us today may be wearing Michigan sweatshirts or Michigan State, maybe not, and um, <laughs> a rough night for him. Um, but that may be your alma mater, that, or that may be your football choice, but it's not who you are. It's not who you are. Your identity doesn't go up and down with their wins and losses. Your identity is set because God says, I am your God, and you will be my people. Some of you are engineers or nurses or architects or surgeons or students. But that's not who you are. That's what you do. Who are you? You're children of the Most High God. I'm your God and you are my people. And God shows this little group of people way back in Genesis chapter 12. When he says to Abram, come out of your country, out of your kindred, and come to a place that I'm going to show you. And Abram, by faith, did. And these people called Jews, we were God's chosen people. Why did he choose them? Exodus, excuse me, Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 7 uh, gives us the answer to that question. Where it says, it was not because you were more in number than other people that the Lord set his love upon you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all people, but it was because the Lord loves you and it is in keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out, of a, out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery and from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. But how did they view this God? They seen his power and his, his muscle, in defeating the most powerful nation in the world at that time. But they had to be asking the questions, does he know us? And can we know him? And how does he love us? And do we love him back? And if we love him back, what does that love look like? 
And God is going to answer all of those questions on a mountain. There's so many wonderful stories that came through the mountains of Scripture, mountain experiences. Someday I want to preach a series on the mountain experiences of the Bible. It may be in a different lifetime now. But that mountain experience I'm referring to here is Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. Most scholars believe, biblical scholars, believe Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai are one and the same. But it's also called by a third name, the Mountain of Yahweh or the Mountain of God. It was there that Moses met God in a burning bush. And here on this mountain, God is going to explain some things that we need to get today. The first one is that we need to recognize that we are set apart for relationship. Um, Notice, uh, before we read 19 verse 6, or verse 4, let me give you a little bit more detail of the background. The children of Israel were in bondage. God delivered them from that. And he brings them to this place powerfully, powerfully. And now the the Egyptians are gone, the plagues are gone, the Red Sea is gone. And it's just in center stage in a desert on a mountain. It's God on the mountain and the children of Israel at the base of the mountain. With one guy going up the mountain, an intermediator or in that mediator named Moses. So Moses comes down the mountain having met with God, and he says to the children of Israel, he says, on the third day, something amazing is going to happen, so consecrate yourselves. And by the way, you'll find that often in the scriptures. Whenever God was going to do something good, particularly in the Old Testament, he would try to prepare the people for that, where he says, consecrate yourself. I think the principle is instructive for us today. If we want to see the mighty hand of God, We have to always be prepared by consecrating ourselves. For them, it was a ceremonial, a consecration. And he gave them instructions on how to do that. And he went back up on the mountain. The second day, he comes back. And he says, listen, don't don't approach the mountain. Don't cross the line. If you can imagine maybe the yellow police tape around the mountain of God. Don't go up. If I'm one of those people, and Moses is going up and down the mountain, I said, Moses, you seem, let me go with you. I've got my hiking, uh, mountain climbing sandals on. Well, let's do this together. We can talk. I won't get in the way, I promise. Um, I'll just listen as you and God talk. Wouldn't you have loved to have done that? God says, no way. Don't go up the mountain. Don't cross the line. Moses went up the mountain, and the third day it happened. (coughs) Excuse me, the Bible says is if God came down in a cloud from heaven to the top of the mountain. And on that day, there were thunderings and lightnings and the blasts of trumpet. Unlike anything that's kept you awake at night, this is, a, this is the presence of God. So much so that the Bible says the mountain began to shake. And it began to shake so violently, it's talked about. It quaked violently. All those people on the base of the mountain who wanted to cozy up to God and have this conversation now realize, I'm so glad I didn't go up that mountain. Later when Moses was, was to come down, they would, say to the, they would say that to him. Don't let us go into the presence of God. You represent us and go for us. What was God doing? God was saying, we've got a relationship. We've got a relationship. And before we get to chapter 20, we have to look at chapter 19. Chapter 19 will make chapter 20 make a whole lot more sense. You take chapter 19 away, all you have is a list of 10 rules. But you have chapter 19. We have relationship. I'm your God, and you're my people. And what God said to them, he also said to us. In Ephesians chapter 1, Um, Let me just read some verses very quickly. What you'll find in Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul is writing to the New Testament church. That's us. And he's recounting what God has done for us. And it's almost as if he's writing and he gets, God loved us. He can't put a period there because that's not all God did for us. Well, he chose us. Another comma. And the sentence goes on and on and on and covers chapter 1, verse 3, through chapter 14. Excuse me, through verse 14. That's one long sentence. 
Let me just give you two or three verses from that. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. Folks, we are loved and we are blessed. And we have this close relationship with God, not with the mediation of Moses, but with the mediation of Jesus. And so we're gathered here today, centuries later, looking at the Ten Commandments here in the next ten weeks. But as we look at those commandments, we have to understand they are not rules without relationship because that will produce rebellion. They are rules with relationship. And the greatest relationship of all the world, it's God with his people and people with their God. I want you to notice with that relationship comes responsibility. By the way, I, I skipped over verse 4. Let me read that. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you up on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. I love eagles. And the eagles, and I'm not talking about the Philadelphia eagles now. I'm talking about eagles. Um, this is an eagle I was given by the people of Russia when I taught there over 20 years ago. Um, eagles, in fact, just this last weekend, we're fishing with way up in Canada with the uh, grandkids and son and son-in-law and men from our church and their boys. Uh, right in front of our boat one day, just as we were landing on an island, there was an eagle that was flying so beautiful, so powerful, so effortlessly in its strength. Um, wow. And this is what God said. I brought you up out of Egypt on eagle's wings. That's the metaphor he uses. It was in my strength and not yours. You were on for the ride. And they, as Dan was singing this morning, they were never, ever supposed to forget that event, just as we're not supposed to forget the cross. We're to remember it at least every month. And we remember it every day because it's who we are. He says, I brought you out on eagles' wings. Why? And by the way, don't you love that old song? It's a few decades old, written by a Catholic priest. On eagles' wings, you'll hear it at every Catholic funeral. On eagles' wings, I bore thee up. Um, it's beautiful. Um, I think the Catholics have had that song long enough. I think there's so much we could learn and grow from that song. It's on eagle's wings, taken from this text as well as from Psalm 91. But notice what it says here. I bore you up on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. In other words, he said, I led you out so I could draw you near. That's what God does. I led you out so I could draw you near. We've got this relationship. Don't forget that when you get to commandment number six. Or commandment number eight or commandment number ten. We have a relationship. The second thing I want you to notice is that relationship carries with it responsibility. Notice verse number five. Now therefore, it, uh, chapter 19, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. God had said uh, there's a boundary. You can't go past it. Moses can come up and relay my messages to you. But there's a responsibility. In this responsibility, you're to love and you're to obey because I own everything. And if you look up at the stars on a clear night, you can see just a fraction of 300 sex trillion stars that God made, that God named, that God placed. Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. We belong to him. And so he says, you are my treasured possession. Those two words have to go together. And they describe in this relationship how God views us. He wants us to be his treasured possession. I grew up in a family in southwestern Minnesota 
there was a wonderful family, but we, we didn't use the word love a lot in our house. And maybe it was our ethnic background, or maybe, it, I don't know why. Um, but love, you kind of had to assume it because it wasn't said. We didn't do hugs, um, and we didn't say those words, I love you. And it wasn't until, uh, you know, my father's with the Lord now, but we were, my wife and I had been married for several years, and we'd visit him at the Christmas time, and, and uh, we were ready to leave their house. And he reaches out and he hugs me. I thought, what are you doing? <laughs> we don't do this. And so when we did the two-word story a few years ago, and you wanted a one word Use two different ways to describe your life. It was easy for me to choose the word loved. Loved. Love? Question mark. When I met Jesus, I knew I was loved. Unconditionally. That he died for me in his love. His death was an expression of the love of God. It was uh, without measurement. God says, you are my treasured possession. I knew you before the foundation of the world. I know you, and even in the bad things that happen in your life right now, don't you know that all those things work together for good to those who are called, who love me, are called according to his purpose? And even the, when the day comes when you leave this life and you're wondering, does God love me? The passage, Psalm 116, verse 15 says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of his saints. He cares about us from the beginning of time, and he's prepared a place for us for the rest of time. And when we see him, we will be like him. And so he says to us, we have this relationship, and you're in my treasured possession. But God, what do we do? What do we do? You have everything. You don't need anything from us. He says, just love me and obey me. Some of you as married couples or perhaps dating couples have read the love languages, the five love languages. And so you know uh, the love language that your, your spouse has or your dating partner has, and it's love or touch or, or words or um, acts of kindness, this kind of thing, loyalty. And you've, the, the challenge is to love the other person, not in your language, but in their language. Um, what's God's love language? Those who have written the books on this will talk about the love language of Jesus, how Jesus would love people through all the different languages. But how does God want to be loved? You can't touch him. You see him only by faith. He said, if you love me, obey. In John 14, the night before Jesus was crucified, he says to the people, if you love me, keep my commandments. We're to, be, we're to be obedient. He sums it up in the next verse by sharing a third thing that we need to recognize. And by the way, from there, um, I'm trying to go too fast. I'm missing stuff, okay? Now hang in there with me, okay? He shares, I want you to obey. And then he shares the Ten Commandments. And those Ten Commandments are very, very well put together, because God shared the Ten Commandments, and the first four are vertical. You shall have no other gods before me. Don't make any graven image. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And take a day and make it holy or set apart for worship of me and for rest. And then you got six more because you have to live in this world with people. And so he gives six more commandments that are horizontal level that affect our relationships with one another. Don't steal, don't lie, um, don't, um, don't envy, envy so you can take. Uh, don't, and God did, just didn't pick things out of the air, so I need one for adultery. Or we need one for this or we need one for that. These all come from his heart or his moral nature. And so the law had several parts. You had the ritual part of the law. You had the ceremonial part of the law. And these are the parts of the law where you're going to read them now in Exodus or Leviticus. And it's going to be the details of how to set up the temple and how long the tassels should be and all of this. And for us, it's tedious. But then you get to the moral part of the law. 
This comes from the heart of God. Those other things are instructive and point to God because the law was both regulatory and revelatory. Regulatory in that it controlled and regulated life. Revelatory in that it talked to us about a person and why he put the law together was God. And so he chose those things that came from his heart. And the, when Jesus came, he fulfilled the law. What is that? The purpose of the law, according to, to Galatians chapter 3, was to teach us that we couldn't live by it. You say, well, wait a minute. If I just kept those Ten Commandments, isn't that salvation by the law? No, not at all. Because what happened before the law was grace. And the picture of salvation is, has nothing to do with the law uh, directly. The picture of salvation is the grace of God that brought us out of Egypt on eagles' wings. And this is an expression of our deliverance and who we are, obedience to the expectations of God. And so he says here, notice in verse, uh, um, verse number 6, and you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Those are the same words God said to Moses with regards to the nation of Israel that God said to the church in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2 and verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So it looks something like that. We're his representatives is the third part that I want you to see today. We're his representatives. So it goes something like this. Here is God. And he says to, God says to himself in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, let us make man in our own image. The word image there means representation. That first and foremost in that word, God is saying, I'm in heaven and you're on earth. You're representing me. You're representing me. And therefore, if you're going to represent me, this is how I want you to live. You're not representing a school. You're not re representing a discipline. You're not representing a country. You're not representing a race. You're representing me. This is how I want you to live. And so he says to all of us, he says, you are a... Somebody asked me in first service today, where in the world are we going to find a pastor who has the art ability that you do? <laughs> and I, said, I said, we're just going to have to pray and fast. That's a good... But, he's, but God is saying here, you're my reps. Why should we live this way? Because God says, when, 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 when people see you, I want them to see me. And so you're going to get bombarded by all kinds of people who are going to mock your, 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 your obedience. They're going to mock your way of life. They're going to call you names. They're going to say those rules that you live by are for another time. You're antiquated. You need to be enlightened. You're going to hear all of this. But don't cave into the world's standards because I've called you to something greater. I'm your God and you're my people and I want you to represent me really, really well on earth. And this is how you need to live. And he gives the Ten Commandments. A holy nation, a royal priesthood. And when people see us, they need to see God. And that means that, folks, our calling... Uh, is continuous and it's marvelous that means when we go to lunch today wherever we go we're representing God that means in our drive home whether it's on a, fee a freeway or a side street we represent God that means in a work setting tomorrow whether hostile or calm we're representing God we're not our own. We're bought with a price. We are treasured possessions. Therefore, we need to glorify God in our bodies and in our spirits, which are God. We are loved by Him, and we respond in obedience. I said this a few weeks ago, and, I, and it just, um, let me say it again. And this is what I run into so often as a, a journey with people together towards Christlikeness. I think an awful lot of people who know Jesus don't believe that he loves them. 
They can check that off in terms of a theological box. He loves me, I know that. The Bible says that we love because he first loved us. But when push comes to shove and the pressures of the world come caving in and remind us that we're worthless, that we're failures, that they could get along without us, maybe even family members have sent that message, you have to know in the cacophony of noises and voices, there's a whisper of God that's continuous where he says, I love you. Would you believe that? And it's not, it's not a theological truth that's going to be life-changing until it's applied to our lives. And it's something that and it's that whisper that we need to hear from God over and over and over and over again. He says, I love you. And his love for us will never change. Sometimes people's love for us is conditional. God's never is. He loves you. Believe it. Live it. It all begins with knowing Jesus. If you don't know him yet, may I strongly encourage you to begin that process by bowing your knee to him in, in faith, belief, and repentance. Believe that Jesus died on the cross so you might live forever. There'll be people here at the front that would love to talk with you and pray with you about salvation and knowing Jesus or about anything you may be going through at this time. We wanted to close with a song today, and I pray that this song will resonate the message of who you are. The team is coming out now and we'll get set up and, and uh, sing this song in a moment. But it's, I hope it resonates with you and reverberates throughout this entire week that we're all loved by God and we know who we are. Therefore, his expectations are easy. Let's stand together, shall we? Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll help us to live out a simple truth that you've reminded us of and who we are as your followers. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Help us to live that way. In Jesus' name, amen.